New Zealand, Aotearoa, has a long history of lesbian music. In the early 20th century, much of it was hidden. An example was composer Ania Lockwood, who was renowned for recording the sound of burning pianos. But by the 1970s, a sense of community was emerging in the bars and clubs of our major cities. One of the focal points was the now demolished Shakespeare Tavern in central Auckland. It featured live and recorded music. One of its first performers was piano player Adele Bridgens. I guess the Shakespeare was probably the first openly gay bar where people knew it was gay. They came to Auckland from within New Zealand and even overseas. It was a place that got a name as being a gay bar and people came there um, because they felt that they could be included. And that inclusiveness, if you think you're alone in those days, as so many people must have, how fantastic to be able to go to a place where you knew there was a lot of other people there that were like you, that thought like you. At the end of the night, on a Friday night, you'd have 200 people there singing loudly just to the piano. There was no fighting, no anger. It was a very beautiful place and it was run by a very beautiful woman. Other gay bars and clubs soon appeared in Auckland. Aquarius, Alfie's, The Staircase, and another famous pub now demolished, the Alexandra Tavern, more commonly known as the Alex. It was here that a brash lesbian rock band made their name, Red Beryl. That was a particularly wonderful time for me. I'd never worked in a band before, and Red Beryl sort of started off being still being quite acoustic, I have to say. We were all a, a fabulous lot. We laughed and we we laughed and we sang and we fell over and we did all sorts of things. We were a great group of, um, of lesbian rejoices we were and did we rejoice. Dear Gertrude Stein, I'm so glad to have discovered you. For Hills King, Nights of the Alex meant more than mere performing. They became a focal point for the lesbian and gay community from the beginning. On our first night playing there, we had people just lining up outside the doors. They had actually worked it so that we stood on the stage, then there were people sitting, crammed up in every table, and then they'd stand, and then they would stand on the little standing bar at the bar, and then they'd sit on the bar, and then the people behind them would stand behind the people sitting, and then we had people sitting on top of the rails at the bar, and people outside the bar doors. And it was just the best time in the world. So we had parties there the whole time that Red Beryl were playing and singing. It was just like one big, great party. I always used to end off the night with um, the Janis Joplin because if I sang it halfway through the night, then I'm sorry, I couldn't sing anything else. My voice just completely went after peace of my heart. It was a, a known affair, a known event. The voice went after peace of my heart. That was always the last thing, no encores. And we played quite a lot at the glue pot too, which was another amazing historic venue. Um, we played with some wonderful bands. Um, we went and saw wonderful bands there. We, we just had a ball, really. It was a great time for music, and particularly for lesbian music. It was in this era that an energised group of young lesbians began forming various bands and experimenting with music and their sexuality. A large number of bands formed, broke up and reformed sometimes with the same members or an infusion of new blood. Their names, like the music, were eclectic. Vibra Slaps, Freudian Slips, The Dolphins, The Pikelets, Siren, The Guile. One influential band was Freudian Slips. There are two things in Freudian Slips. So the, the, the people that could write a really good, pretty pop song, and um, Cassie Sheehan was definitely one of those, and Penny and Amanda. And then there was um, the lyrics, which, as I said, were, it could be quite hard hitting. And also exploring, like, I think the orgasm one, which we all wrote about being non orgasmic, um, you know, was, it was kind of out there. There was always a mix of political opinions and, and a mix of 
how interested people were in politics. Paula Connolly and Lisa did some great songs, you know, about, you know, um, Superman or something, you know, and, and we did some very angry kind of songs amongst, you know, so the co lyric content at times was extremely feminist or lesbian feminist, but a lot of the songs were just about romantic love, you know, they weren't, you know, or, or being heartbroken, you know, versions of that, yeah. But there, we definitely had our um, ones where we tried to deconstruct a little bit the kind of power systems. And it was the 80s too, you know, so it was the time of kind of quite overblown music, you know, we were, everyone, you know, there was that kind of, you know, the um, synthesizer was just coming in and, you know, you know, people were kind of, it was kind of pseudo grand, you know, there was that kind of tone to some of it, which we got caught up in a bit more than maybe we needed to. Sad thing for me is we wrote, there were so many great songs that we haven't got a decent record, record of. The band recorded two EPs in the 1980s. The first was called On The Line. We did two EPs. Um, we, had, we did one with Donna and we actually, I think we actually nearly got into, we got onto the pop programs with, our, with uh, one of the songs that Jackie had written about being a deviant. And uh, that was, you know, if you're a deviant dance, and it was quite fun. The second was titled, Are You Laughing? That was kind of when we were quite serious. That we were always serious, but, you know, we were, it was more like we had this, you know, we had a core group of five lesbians, and um, it must have been around the homosexual law reform time as well, and we all wrote into Metro that we were all proud to be lesbian feminists, you know, and we signed all our names as Freudian slips, or, you know, our individual names, so that was around that time. Another popular band at the time was Vibra Slaps, known for having a unique sound. Vibra Slaps in some ways was one of the most experimental bands around, and um, it was very comfortable. It, for me, it was the niche, you know, that I wanted to be in. And also, um, I think we were all sort of a little bit, and you know, there was a lot of in love stuff happening. We started writing our own lyrics, and they were very much, you know, love songs between women, you know, that kind of thing. So it wasn't a big conscious, we're going to write a lesbian song, but it was such a part of, like, it was kind of like everything we did was in this kind of, group of lesbian, queer, music, politics, marches, you know, youth work, all the stuff that we were doing was kind of politicised and so naturally the music kind of became like that as well, even though we weren't. I think the lyrics from Vibra Slaps were incredibly poetic and also, you know, a lot of them were about justice or more conceptual things like there's a band, there's a song called Crooked Lines that um, Gina, Diane and, and Claire sing um, and yeah, the, very conceptual and then uh, I did one about the, because I was thinking about the subatomic level of physics and how that would correlate with musical, with the notes of the scale and what the earth resonates with. So that was another song about atomic, subatomic, etc. The lyrics I think were always, um, you know, pretty odd <laughs> when you read them <laughs> going back yeah so love songs and and also just kind of you know well Sani in particular had a particular kind of surrealist symbolist kind of way of expressing herself which was neat and unusual. Vibra Slaps also created an EP which was funded by the QE2 Arts Council and supported by Kiwi rocker Chris Knox. We went to um, the Coromandel to this recording studio on a gorgeous beach in the middle of nowhere and um, we put down five tracks. There was a sound engineer called Jim, who was great and basically it was like a, a, a hay shed, you know, with amazing equipment inside it and then you come out of the door from recording and there's just this completely gorgeous, empty, white sand beach in a cove. It was a perfect place to go because it was there were no other influences, no phones, no other people coming and going. And we had an amazing week there where we just recorded.
recorded our songs, wrote some new ones, had lots of good food and yeah, it was perfect. The cover went from um, me looking for the image of a cow under a cabbage tree to represent the Aotearoa reality compared to the camel, uh, the camel under the palm tree that you'd see in other places. And I went up and down the country looking for that. I was excited about cigarettes then and, you know, I wanted, I thought I could develop, and, you know, it was just, I, would, I just thought it was a great image of a, being brought up on a dairy farm, as, you know, a lot of people are here, and the cabbage tree. We never went to Taranaki, which is where you see cows under cabbage trees. So Linda Fell came up with that design, and Linda Fell, Monica, um, is an artist, and... Kay Schumack, who's also an artist, were involved in the artwork. We made 500 records and they all went, so I guess, you know, we had quite a few fans of, of friends and family and things like that, and the local music scene was always supportive of new records coming out, because it was a big thing, you know, even EPs, you know, so it was, it was really good, and also because it was connected to Flying Nun, obviously had a, a certain, you know, um, support from that whole network too. Many of the bands around this time had members who played in other bands or who reformed bands into new ones. Karen Kahurengi, a singer, was part of bands such as Siren, The Pikelets and the one that holds a special place for her, The Dolphins. It was a rock band, it was a real rock band I think, apart from ones that I've been with men before. This one was better because it had the drive of women, and I know that that sounds sexist and shit, but something about that um, had this soul to it that just took your breath away. I, I think that now, I don't know if I did then. I even remember the, the gigs and stuff. It really, I think it would have blown people away. And there's a few, um, what do you call them, um, journalists, uh, people have written about, uh, wrote about a few of our gigs, and. They were quite gobsmacked, and I thought at the time they were just, you know, brown nosing. I wasn't sure what, maybe because these are all girls, we better make them, you know, build them up. I don't know what it was about, but I think maybe it was real. Looking back, it probably was quite a remarkable pack of women, really. We all had a, had a chance at uh, picking which which songs we did. Mostly they were covers, although I must say Frankie wrote a few, maybe you know, five or maybe even 10 of our um, songs and they were very good originals. They weren't just originals for the hell of it. Karen was also a member of The Guile, another band featuring a lot of female talent. Sani Dara was also a member. That started with me going around to Karen's place and just being absolutely in love with her voice and I would just I just wanted to back that voice. I just thought she had such a powerful voice. You know, she didn't need anything but her voice and she would just open her mouth and sing and um, everyone would listen. The guy was like this wave that came and it was like riding that wave was incredibly exciting. Um, it, was, it was just so exciting sometimes in that with that number of women all being together and just, you know, the vocals were just unbelievable with um, Betty and Karen and Nettie. It wasn't just bands who made an impact. Acts, like the Top Twins, managed to have mainstream careers. And singer-songwriters such as Mahina Rangatoka had a large following. In the lesbian community, however, other less mainstream individuals contributed to our musical heritage. One such performer was Hazel May, who loved playing and singing. Her songs were unmistakably about being lesbian. The songs that I created were about sex, blatantly about sex. Uh, some people loved them, other people went, oh my God, you can't sing that. <laughs> Uh, but usually lesbians identified them and, uh, you know, I, I, I usually just sing at parties and, and gather, gatherings. I, I can't think that I ever sang them on stage. I was just saying something about myself. I was celebrating something about me 
and about my friends that I thought was pretty damn fine. Uh, Celebrating orgasms. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Celebrating sex. Um, because, because that's the thing that, you know, when you come out, that's the thing everyone wants to focus on, isn't it? Sex, sex. And then we're all busy saying it's not only about the sex, you know, it's about um, putting out the rubbish and feeding the cat. And, and, and that is true. That is true. But all, But for me... The central part about being a lesbian was having a sexuality that felt normal. For Hazel, music was key to forming community. I think music's always been quite a rallying call for people. You know, if you go back to families around the piano, there's that sense of unity. Everyone knows the song and we all sing it this way and we feel good. So, of course, if you have um, a, a brand of music that is uh, identified as lesbian, then you increase your sense of belonging with each other. Um, you increase your sense of um, pride, self-esteem. Um, and you can also call others to you. You know, you're singing this song and then someone's saying, oh, they must be lesbians. Uh, yeah. So I think it is a, you know, whale whale song. It's a whale song. Yeah, it, it's calling, calling out there to the other ones. Yeah. At some point, it stopped. The bands broke up, and the women went on to other things. I, I don't really know when the music died for us. I don't really know how it happened. It was it's it was a slow process. Um, Many of us got proper jobs um, and moved and um, women started to have babies and children. Um, I'm not sure what happened, but the, the climate, the political climate changed um, and we were in the, in the post, post era, post feminist, post modernist. And now I think it's a much more individual cult um, that there aren't collections of women who, who come together because of feminism. People wanted to go to London basically and, and it, it had a cost, you know, the life had a, um, we were in pubs a lot, so we were, you know, some of us were drinking pretty heavily. Um, we, there's never any money in it. Things have their life, you know, and um, it definitely had, had its life, you know, and we left on a pretty good feeling. I think some of the relationships in the band, you know, the, the intensity of the relationships was, um, yeah, it was something, you know, like people at times couldn't stand each other, you know, which is really common in bands. We would have been together for three years, but we never really formally split up, as some, one, of, one of them said recently. So we could actually get back together. And that is really sort of the vibra slap idea. I mean, I, I, don't know who, I don't know who gave the name vibra slap, but I think they were very forward thinking in terms of the idea of vibration and resonance and all the stuff that um, is coming through today about um, that level of energy and things. And I think Vibraslap's very much like that. I mean, I think they could be quite current, given a few changes. And they're still in my soul, they're still in my heart. I don't know, man. I mean, you know, bands like in every avenue, and not just bands, but groups of people that get together and do remarkable things, they just don't last, eh? I mean, good marriages don't bloody last. So. I can't really put it down to any one thing. There was a time when I blamed the whole fucking thing on myself. You know, it was me, I screwed up, I drank too much, took too many drugs, you know, did, had too many stupid relationships, and I'm sure that was a part of it. I'm positive it was. But I'm also positive it wasn't all me. There's a lot of <laughs> screwed up people out there, I just happen to be one of them. I think we should all actually have an anthology. I mean, I really, I really get worried that Val Murphy hasn't got an anthology of her, all her wonderful songs. Um, and I sort of think, well, if I think that way about her, perhaps I should do the same. And it's probably true. And maybe that we should have another, I, I mean, I, I think we should have another 
web record and now they're out of the corners myself. It would be wonderful. It's possible too. Have to get all the girls together. Okay. <laughs> Never put your finger in a dike. Never put your finger in a dike. Never put your finger unless you wanna linger. Cause darling, you'll be there all night. Dear Gertrude Stein. I'm so glad to have discovered you In a world that gives no value To the life that I chose And so did you Dear Gertrude Stein I just want to thank you